Good morning, everybody. So we are on to uh, today's lesson on apologetics, being certain of your Christian faith, right? And start with introducing what is apologetics. It's a big word. And why do we need it? Apologetics, first of all, has nothing to do with uh, saying sorry, that kind of apology, but it is a special term, which means um, apologia in Greek, the, the original language, and it means defense. So you give a defense or an explanation of your conduct, your behavior, and your procedure, what you do, why you do. Okay, so that's apologia in Greek, meaning defense or an explanation, not saying sorry. Now, so it, apologetics explains what we believe as people who uh, accept Christ, who accept the Bible, why we believe Christ, why we believe the Bible, and why we do what we do. So very much something to do with explaining our lifestyle. Okay, so where does that come from? Well, 1 Peter 3 verses 15 to 16 tells us, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. Now, this word in English, an answer, is the Greek word I said just now, apologia. So always be prepared to give an apology, a defense or an explanation to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So in Christ, you have a hope, you have an eternal hope. So you give an explanation or a defense to give the reason for the hope in Christ that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. So that's the attitudes we need to have. Gentleness and respect, even though our defense, our explanation is the truth, we don't shove it down people's throat. So do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that the purpose those who speak maliciously, right? They are harmful. They're trying to hurt. Those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander, right? So speaking maliciously is their slander. So this reference tells us it starts with having our hearts set apart, Christ as Lord. Then we should be prepared to give an explanation or a defense for the reason for the hope that we have. So do it with gentleness and respect as we explain. So this is where the idea of apology comes from if we are looking for a Bible verse, right? Giving an explanation or a defense to people who ask why you believe in Christ. So why do we need it? Now, the truth of Christianity depends on the Bible. Everything starts with the Bible for uh, Christianity, and it depends on the accuracy and the reliability of the Bible. Right? So if the the Bible is true, it must be accurate, it must be reliable, something that we can depend on, then it makes sense to accept Christianity, to accept Christ. If the Bible is exclusive, that means it is the only Holy Scripture and correct in its divine revelation, that means from God. Yeah, it is the only true and correct revelation from God, something that comes from God. Then it is the most important book 
ever written in the history of mankind and the world. So everything about this world and about human lives, human history, hinges on the truth that the Bible is exclusive, the only scripture that is correct and that reveals the word from the true and only God. Now, the, only the Bible says that there is an infinite, all-wise, all-powerful, all-loving creator God who made the universe. The Bible is the only scripture that makes that claim. He created the universe. And then we see that he revealed himself, this creator God who created the universe. So he created himself, uh, sorry, he created the universe and revealed himself by natural and supernatural means in creation. So through what he created, right, naturally, using natural ways, as well as supernatural powers, he reveals himself. He shows himself to be the creator God. And he reveals himself in the nature of man, helping us to understand what we are and what we are like. And then the third one is he revealed himself in the history of Israel and the church. So what has happened in the Bible uh, with the people of Israel? You see that there's a relationship God had with Israel. And he reveals himself through this relationship with Israel, as well as the relationship with the church in the New Testament. Fourth is God revealed himself in the pages of the Holy Scripture, the Bible. So through reading the Bible, we see something about God that we would never be able to know if there's no Bible. Something about God we would never be able to know if there is no Bible. So the Bible is a very important uh, medium by which we know God. So he revealed himself, number five, in the incarnation as Christ. That means he was born, he is God, he, is, he was born as a man in the person of Christ. And then revealed himself, number six, in the heart of the believer. So the believer is able to sense and to have a relationship with God in his heart, although he cannot see God physically. And then, of course, God revealed himself through the gospel of salvation, the good news that God has saved us for a very important purpose. So this is God revealing himself in these ways, and we can find these things in the Bible. So the Bible records a continuous historical account of mankind. So the Bible has a story that tells us history of man from the very beginning, from the very first man, Adam, and all the way to the end of history for mankind. So if I draw a timeline, after creating uh, this, this green timeline, this green arrow, this timeline, after creating the universe, God also created Adam, who was the first man. And then history went on with the time of the story of mankind. And it will continue till the end of history. The Bible tells us what will happen at the end of history the end of the world to the last, uh, to, to the planet Earth. And that will involve, of course, the last man on Earth. And after the end of the world will come the beginning of eternity, represented by this blue dotted line, this time. So the Bible tells us 
about people, how the first man came about all the way to the end of the world. And so in that sense, the Bible accompanies human beings and tells human beings what happens and God's plans. So the Bible reveals God's purpose of a planned eternal destiny for men. It's not an accident. God already had in mind how it would start and then he planned it all the way knowing uh, the problem of sin and so on. And he planned it all the way so that at the end of the world, eternal destiny for men would begin in the way that God has always wanted. So if the Bible is correct, then the truth about man's salvation journey in this life is critically important to every person on earth. Okay, if the Bible is correct. So we want to explore, we want to study the accuracy and the correctness of the Bible. Because if it is truly correct, then the Bible is really, really very important for every person on earth. As we saw just now, uh, it's about mankind from the very first man all the way to the end of history. So, so question again, why do we need apologetics? Why do we need a defense or an explanation of our Christian faith? Well, in the midst of life, there are so many truths. You know, all kinds of faiths, all kinds of beliefs. People talk about all kinds of truths and claims to truth, being true, being correct. So life and faith can be confusing because there's so many truths. How do we know which one or which ones are correct? What can we know for sure? Too many truths. Now, if you look at this picture, this picture has got lots of things inside here. So it's kind of like saying that there are many truths, many things. And really, um, it's very hard to focus on something that stands out as significant in this picture, right? Nothing really stands out as significant in this picture. Something like truth. There are so many offers of truth. There are so many claims to truth. Everything is all there. How do you pick out something that is distinct? Well, I don't know how many of you can see, but this picture hides a message. Okay? I wonder how many of you can see this, but this picture hides a message. And that message, if you can see it, will stand out among all this whole mess. Okay, can anybody tell me what you see that stands out in this picture? Now, let me give you a clue. If you just keep staring at the obvious, you will not find it. Okay, let me explain that this is a this is a 3D picture. That means to find the message, it is beyond the surface. Just looking at the picture itself isn't going to help. You have to look into the picture. Anybody found anything? Don't tell us what you found yet. Anybody found? Yes. Okay, yes, Jacob. Said, yes. Okay, so we have two people who have seen something. Anybody else sees? Right, I give you some time to look for those who haven't found it. Okay, can I ask uh, Jacob and Jacqueline, 
How many words can you see? Two words. Two words. Okay, good. Uh, what about Jacqueline? Okay, so those of you who are still looking, you have to look for two words. Jacqueline, do you have two words? Anybody else has seen two words inside this picture? Okay. Uh, sorry, anybody else? So this picture that I have here is kind of like an illustration. There's so many things to get our attention, right? But the truth is actually beyond the surface. So we have to be able to actually look deeper into the picture to see that there is a message of two words. Jacqueline, have you found the two words? Okay, Jacob, look carefully. Besides the two words, there's something else there, right? Don't say what it is if you see it. Don't say what it is if you see it. Do you see anything else? A, sim yes. a symbol? Yeah, okay. Okay, so for, for the benefit of everybody, right? This picture has two words and a symbol, a kind of a picture. Right, so all together, you're supposed to look for three things. Huh? The three things are two words and a picture of something. Right, so, so you see, all of us struggle with the surface picture because there's so many things grabbing our attention. And it's just like the world, just like the world, there's so many truths. People make claims to truth and so on. And people teach us all kinds of things to belief, talk about faith. The reality is that there's only one truth that we need to pay attention to, which will actually stick out. The only truth that will stick out from this whole mess, and it's not so obvious because you have to look deeper into it. So that is apologetics about Christianity, the defense and explanation of Christianity how from looking at the surface, we have to go deeper. If we don't go deeper, we will not see the true message that it carries for us. Okay, we'll come back to this picture another uh, later. Let's look at the next one, the next slide. Okay, so here is the same picture. Uh, apologetics, why do we need it? We need apologetics to examine the truth of the Christian faith, to know and be sure of it. So that's the first point. So here's the same picture. We have to examine this just like we are examining the Christian uh, faith so that we can, be, can know and be sure of it. Now, if you don't know how to look at this kind of picture, uh, here is a, a little bit of guidance, okay? To view hidden image and stereo field stereograms, you cannot use normal or cross-eyed vision, figure one. You can't use normal vision the way you look at it. Instead, you have to use parallel vision. There you go, parallel vision, figure two, which is what you will do automatically if you place a piece of card between your eyes when viewing the images. So if you can get a piece of paper or a card, put it between your eyes and look at it, okay? Unlike cross-eyed vision, there is no strain or discomfort with parallel vision. So you're not straining. The essential key, in fact, is to relax your eyes into viewing this way. So let me explain and help you. Can you see these two blue dots here on this picture, the top of this the picture? Can you see the two, two blue dots I put up here? Same picture. Now, I just add on the two blue dots. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to focus your eyes on the center here 
right where my cursor is, my arrow cursor, focus so that you end up seeing three blue dots. Okay, if you can focus in the center so that you end up seeing three blue dots, then hold that way of looking and you will be able to penetrate deeper into this picture to see the words. Okay, I'll give you, uh, I, I keep quiet and let you try that. Let me repeat the instruction one more time and I'll give you silence to focus. Huh? The two blue dots here, focus your vision on the center in such a way that you will end up seeing three blue dots. Okay, and when you see three blue dots, continue to look at it in that way and look at the picture and you will see something inside the picture. Now, if anybody else sees anything, say, say out loud, I see something, but don't, don't say out the two words yet. Yeah, you, so now you focus on the two, in the center of the two blue dots. Focus on the center of the two blue dots right in the spot here until the two dots become three dots. Okay, for this part, actually, you don't need a cut anymore. You just focus on the center. Okay, anybody else has found the words inside the picture? No, okay. So not to worry. Um, examining the truth of the Christian faith is not so challenging, but for those of you who learn how to look at this kind of pictures, once you get the hang of it, then you will find it to be easier. Okay, so we we'll move on. Later on, there's one more chance for you to try. <laughs> okay. Ah, so then don't use then use don't use the card. Okay, so the next, so the first thing we said to apologetics, we need it to examine the truth of the Christian faith so that we can know and be sure of it. Now, second reason why we need apologetics, to be convinced it is God's absolute truth. Right? The Bible is God's absolute truth. We examine apologetics to be convinced of that. And then to be able to share or ex at least explain or defend it. Of course, it's not an exam, so you can always make notes. Right? Okay, so to be convinced of God's absolute truth. Do you see this picture? There's something here that seems to be, doesn't quite make sense. On first, on first uh, looking at it, it doesn't seem to make sense, right? What happened to, what doesn't seem to make sense? No the legs. lady, huh? No legs. No legs, yeah. Okay, so the first obvious thing about this picture is the lady has no legs. What happened to the lady's legs? Cut off. Disappeared. Huh? She's sitting on top of the ledge, I think. <laughs> yeah. Ah, she's sitting on top of the ledge. Yes, correct. That's one possible answer. She's not standing with the rest. She's sitting on the top. That's one possibility. Okay, the other possibility is She's actually standing on the other side, right? The other possibility is that she's standing on the other side of this fence. She's not. 
just not on this side with the other four people. Okay, so you see, um, looking at this picture or sometimes looking at God's truth, it can seem a little bit weird, right? It doesn't seem to match everything else around it, but then there must be an explanation that makes sense, right? So that is where apologetics comes in. We try to make sense of somehow God's truth not seeming the same as everything else or everyone else around us. And once we see and understand it, then we can share, explain, or defend it. So there are actually two possible reasons why the lady's legs are missing. And this picture doesn't seem to, be, to, to make sense. And the two reasons are she's either sitting on the top or she's actually on the other side of this barrier. Okay, so we need apologetics to be able to explain it and to make sense of it. We need apologetics to make sense of God's absolute truth. Okay, apologetics, why do we need it? Another illustration why we need it. Some of you would be familiar with this picture. Now, you have this picture here, then you have four dots right here. This one will be easier than the, than the other one, so not to worry, okay? You have the four dots. Stare at the four dots for 30 seconds. After that, you turn your eyes to this side where there's a blank space for you on the right. Blink, blink here okay. and then continue yeah. to stare. So fast can see the face of Jesus. <laughs> uh, yeah, this girl so fast. <laughs> okay, the others, give it a try. Stare at the four dots. Yeah, I can see seconds. the face of Jesus also. Yeah, face of Jesus. Okay, let the rest have a try, okay? I'm okay. You got it? Yeah. Okay, next, anybody else? Are you staring at the four dots? Okay, then you look at the white spot, right? Okay. So what do you see? Can you see a, a, a man? Okay, the face of a man. Huh? Okay, nobody said Jesus. Huh? We don't all just assume it's Jesus. <laughs> yeah, we have this, we have this stereotype, this picture that we think is what how Jesus looks. Okay, so yes, this picture is easier. This is picture is easier to see and to make sense of it. All right, so there are certain things that we are able to share. Uh, we are certain and we can share with conviction. So if we, by understanding apologetics, understanding what we believe, why we believe, and the influence it has on our life, how we live, okay, then we can share with conviction and give witness to it, right? Just like this picture is so much easier. Uh, if this picture was inside the earlier picture, you would be able to tell me straight away, right? So the other picture takes a little more time. So that's the idea of apologetics. There are some things that are quite easy, you know, when you stare at it, when you pay attention to it, some things are quite easy to understand and to make out. But there are certain things that need deeper understanding. Right? And then in the world of all the truths and all the faiths, it takes that kind of exploration deeper in to really get the message, the fuller message. Okay, so we're back to the picture. Um, and why we need apologetics is to determine the absolute truth, right? Determine the absolute truth and make sense of it in order to fulfill meaning and purpose of life as God intended, right? So why we need apologetics, the fourth point is to be able to conform to it and live it. 
live it in the midst of all the endless and confusing truths of the world. Okay, so here is your one last look today at this picture. If you can find the two words and a symbol inside. And if you can, at least for this picture, you will determine the absolute truth and make sense of what this picture hides. I give you silence to focus for a little while. You haven't seen this kind of picture before? Three, 3D picture. Huh. It's supposed to look deeper inside and there's a picture inside. It's like in looking into the ocean's waters. Anyone else found it? Okay, not to worry if you cannot, I will, for those of you who are on WhatsApp with me, I will send this to you and you can stare at it all you want, okay? Let's continue. <laughs> okay, so we want to explore the fundamental truths about the Christian faith. So what we want to do is among the mess of information about truth and faith, we want to explore the Christian faith so that it stands up for us. So first point, is the Christian faith is an intelligent and rational faith, okay? Uh, it makes sense. See, the Bible appeals to the mind. So it's not a blind faith, like some people say. Huh? Some people think that Christianity is a blind faith. You just believe. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. You don't just believe. So the Bible appeals to the mind as well as the heart, it is actually an intelligent faith. And those who say just believe, they don't know what they are saying. Because you see, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 38, and this part, there's a deep person asking him a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So you see, the faith of loving God involves your mind, your emotions, and your will. So if it involves your mind, right, that means it involves your intelligence, and it makes sense. It is rational so we can love god in a way that is of the mind and it is rational not a blind love not a blind faith and not just simply uh, nonsensical so that's the first thing intelligent rational faith and this is the greatest commandment, okay? The fact that it is an intelligent faith is actually embedded in the greatest commandment. Has to do with your mind, your understanding, your intelligence. Another one, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's from John 8, verse 31 and 32. Okay, so you, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, what he means is if you practice, okay, you hold on to my teaching means you practice my teaching. Then you prove that you are really his disciples and there is a result then. So it's a process. It has the result that you will know the truth. So the truth is not something that is information. 
it's not just a piece of teaching. It has to be held on to in practice, practicing the teaching. And then you will know because you will experience and mentally in your mind, you will be able to appreciate the truth. And that truth will set you free. So it's an intelligent faith. You will know the truth. It's all within the mind to understand and to make sense. A testimony, 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. This is Paul's testimony. Apostle Paul, I know whom I have believed. And am convinced. Uh, so here's another word convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. So you have knowing and then you have conviction, which is the next level of knowing. Once you know, the next thing is conviction, certainty. From moving, knowing. See, from believing to knowing to being convinced. So Christianity is based on evidence that is intelligent and reasonable practice. Something that we do holding on to the teachings of Jesus. Right? So that it moves from believing to knowing to being convinced. So nothing deceptive about it. Right, then there's this quote from this person, Paul Little. He says, we cannot pander to a man's intellectual arrogance, but we must cater to his intellectual integrity. What he's, he really means by intellectual arrogance versus intellectual integrity is that sometimes people are too proud. Mentally, they are too proud to be able to uh, be objective, you know, give it a fair chance to explore openly, honestly. So we cannot pander to a man's intellectual arrogance means the person thinks he's right. He refuses to be open. He refuses to be honest, to explore the truth. We cannot pander to a man who is intellectually arrogant, refuses to explore the truth. He just has in mind, in his pride, he has in, in his mind has an answer and he refuses to budge from what he thinks. We cannot pander to that. But for a person who has intellectual integrity, yes, this is a person who wants to know the honest truth who allows the honest truth to speak to him. And once he knows the honest truth, then he will respond to it with openness and honesty. Okay, so we can cater to somebody who, is, who has got intellectual integrity. He's able to accept the honest truth when he explores it openly without prejudice. Okay, so in other words, we can discuss with people Christianity. We can explore apologetics with people who are open to discover the truth, uh, but it will be very difficult to explore it with somebody who is arrogant, already made up his mind that whatever it is, you're not going to convince me about what I be already believe. So when we explore and study the Bible objectively, without prejudice, we will discover that the Bible is not only true and accurate, it also makes intelligent and rational sense. Okay, being open, honest, uh, not prejudiced. So the next thing about Christianity is it's a historical, factual faith. So it's based on history, things that have happened that are records. 
just like we have records of World War II and even World War I, right? Maybe World War I, not so much as World War II, but that is the history that's recorded information that is factual. Okay, so it's indisputable history facts. Christianity has indisputable history facts. Cognitive, something we can study, something we can examine. Informational, it has got information that we can look at. It's evidential. It can give us proof. It can give us conviction. It can give us proof. And it is intelligent. It is totally rational. Just like we know facts about our World War II. Although I'm sure none of us here is old enough to have lived through World War II, we know it is a fact, even though we didn't live through it, right? Because it is cognitive, informational, informational evidential, intelligent, based on history facts that are indisputable. So, in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we have a little bit of this. Can somebody help us to read? Oh, there are a few words here, names, that you may struggle with. Can somebody help us to read that? Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a censor should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so we can explore history facts by talking about Caesar Augustus. Yeah, so Caesar, so uh, story of Jesus' birth is connected to the days of Caesar Augustus and especially a census during his uh, reign. That was during the Roman Empire. And there was also this governor called Quirinius, governor of Syria. Okay, now everyone went to his own town to register. So that will require a bit more specific, very detailed, minor details of people going to their towns to register. But as long as there's a census, you know that that's the going to be hometown would make sense. Okay, so that is. There's historical information of the people and a census. So these are things that we can study into and go and uh, search for. Then we have another reference, Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Okay, this one really full of names. So anybody who's confident with your pronunciation of names can read this for us. If the 15, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip Tetrarch of Ituria and Traconitis and Lasanius Tetrarch of uh, Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Siapas, the word of God came to John of Zechariah in the desert. Okay, thank you, Jacob. All right, so note the appeal to time. <coughs> and for this, I've used uh, blue, right? The 15th year of the reign, that's a time. And the places uh, mentioned, Judea, Galilee, Ituria, Traconitis, Abilene, right? And then the people, Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Herod, 
and Herod had a brother, Philip, then Lysan Lysanias, Annas, and Caiaphas. John, son of Zechariah. So there are names mentioned, very specific details, and events. Right? So events is uh, when Pilate was a governor, Herod, Herod was a tetrarch together with Philip, also a tetrarch, Lysanias, also a tetrarch. And at the same time, the high priesthood of these two men, right? So that's events, the timing of all these details that actually existed in history. So the truth about the Christian faith that this happened, John the, John the Baptist started his ministry in the desert, right? Happened at this very specific time of all these people, doing all these events, being governor, being tetra, and being high priest, okay? So it's all this information actually existed in history. And you can see that the details are so specific, there's no way to run away and create something because people can always make research to zoom in at this specific period of history. So it's historical, it's factual. You can't run away from it. It's either finding the information to prove this, or if you lack information, then you, know, you, you can't prove this. But the fact is it's historical, okay? So the historical truths of the Christian faith are on record. Is written down for us to go and research and attested, confirmed by first-hand eyewitness account. You have these people alive. Okay, and so in Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, you have first-hand eyewitness accounts. Can somebody read for us, please? Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the world of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you. Most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Thank you. Okay, so many people have actually uh, written that drawn up an account of the things that have been fulfilled. Okay, things that have actually happened according to prophecy earlier in an earlier parts of the Bible just as they were handed down to us. So you see the first-hand people, first-hand account, direct experience by those who from the first were eyewitnesses. And because they were eyewitnesses, they lived through it. They were servants of God's word. So they spent their life serving God because they were eyewitnesses. First-hand eyewitnesses. So once you investigated, you see, he carefully investigated everything from the beginning. So he's like a detective and we know from historical records that this writer Luke was very accurate. He was a very reliable and accurate historian. He's actually a medical doctor, but he took on the task of exploring and investigating so that, so that the, his target audience, Theophilus, can know the certainty of the things that he learned, right? So we have first-hand eyewitness accounts. And the historical truths of the Christian faith are on account and attested or confirmed by first-hand eyewitness accounts. Uh, can somebody help us to turn to John 20, another person, Acts 1, another person, Acts 10, 
And the last person, First Corinthians 15. So this is where you use your Bible, please. John 20, verse 30 and 31. Uh, John 20. John. Okay, you go ahead. Okay, thanks. John 20, verse 30 to 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Thank you. Okay, so you see down there that uh, Jesus did many signs, miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples. So they saw it or saw the signs for themselves, the miracles. And these are written that you may believe. So he has recorded some for first-hand observation so that people may believe and have life in his name. Okay, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken, taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Thank you. Okay, so uh, you see that he showed himself. He showed himself to the men, right? The apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. So he died, but he was resurrected and he gave convincing truths. So he was physically with a group of people and he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. So he was with them for 40 days. So it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense to think that it is just some kind of hallucination or imagination, right? Because he appeared to a whole group of people and it's not just one time for a mysterious encounter, but it's for many days, 40 days. So you cannot be fooling 40 people 40 days and a lot of people besides them. Okay, Acts chapter 10. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of his brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom were still living, though some had fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And the last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Uh, I think you're reading 1 Corinthians 15, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So 1 Corinthians 15, you can see that is Paul giving his own personal testimony um, that he, uh, there were more than 500 people that Jesus appeared to. Okay, if you look at this reference from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6 to 8, you can count that Jesus appeared, first of all, to Peter, verse 5, and then to the 12. So Peter and the remainder of the 12, that makes 12 people. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers. So that's to say, in those 40 days after Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to more than 500 people and 12, 512 people. So it's very hard to, it's very hard to fake it with a 512 plus plus people in the open. It's not in an auditorium with gimmicks, you know, all kinds of uh, technical 
projections and all that sort of stuff. They didn't have all this sort of stuff at that time. Right, so in the open and in various places, Jesus appeared to more than 500 people after resurrection. And then he appeared to James, and then he appeared to Apostle Paul himself. Right, so there are a lot of first-hand eyewitnesses to confirm the truth about Jesus. Yeah, let's look at Acts chapter 10, verse 39 to 42. Yeah, Acts chapter 10, verse 39. And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on cross. But God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all the living and the dead. Thank you. Okay, so there you see uh, we are witnesses and the witnesses that God has chosen to, uh, to eat with him and drink with him after he rose from the dead. So it's hard to think of person eating with a person who rose from the dead if it's just imagination, right? And so we see that... Um, these are more than 500 people, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, right, who actually got allowed to encounter the risen Christ and experience him personally, eating and drinking with him, uh, meeting him, listening to him. Okay, so you have the Christian faith is based on first-hand eyewitness accounts, experience. So something very difficult to fake. Now, 1 Peter 5, verse 1, this is the testimony of uh, Peter himself. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Okay, down here, there are some important truths. Right. First of all, Jesus, uh, sorry, Peter appeals as a witness. Yeah, so he is saying that he saw, he was personally present. Uh, and not just personally present on one occasion, but he was a witness of Christ's sufferings. So he was present through the days of Jesus. He was present with Jesus as a witness for, in fact, three years to three and a half years. Okay, so he actually walked with Jesus, he ate with Jesus, he listened to Jesus and so on for three to three and a half years. And he's also teaching us that he is one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So one day, Christ has promised glory to those who... Uh, follow him. He will, Peter will share in the glory to be revealed, something in the future. All right, so it starts with his conviction because he was actually a witness present. Second Peter 1 verse 16, he again confirms, we did not follow cleverly invented stories. So whatever he says, he's not making it up. He did not follow cleverly invented story. So he's going by the truth, by his experience of Christ. When we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter was present to see the majesty of Jesus when he was on the mountain the mountain of transfiguration when he started shining brightly like the sun. Peter saw Jesus' glory. That's why he knows that there is glory to be revealed in future 
and he knows that Jesus says he will share in the glory. So we are people destined to share in the glory of Jesus one day, although not the same level of glory as Jesus himself. Okay, then 1 John 1 verses 1 to 3, this is the disciple John. Just now that was Peter giving his own testimony. Now we have a second testimony from the disciple John. Can somebody unmute and read for us? First John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just like Peter gave his personal testimony, John also affirmed his own uh, first-hand testimony. We have heard, we have seen, we have looked at, okay? So seeing can be misleading. So they looked at means they paid careful attention and they have also touched. So heard, seen, touched. Of course, they cannot taste Jesus, right? except the spiritual experience of tasting his goodness and so on. So they have seen and they testify. That's why they can proclaim proclaim what they have seen and heard. So they're just reporting the truth. They're just reporting the facts. Okay, so the writers of the New Testament appeal to the first-hand knowledge of the readers or listeners. So not just these uh, disciples only, but they actually refer to their listeners or to their readers for them to confirm their own personal first-hand knowledge. So this is a bigger pool of people now, uh, besides the disciples, the 12 disciples. Okay, so this is where Acts chapter 2, verse 22, uh, it said, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you, to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Okay, so God did among you, right in your presence, you yourselves know. So he's appealing to first-hand knowledge of the people themselves. Okay, so it's not just a group of disciples claiming everything, but they also appeal to the other people who are not Christians yet. Right? And they said to those that are not Christians yet, you yourselves know because all these things happen right where you were. Yeah, you can't run away from it because you are witnesses yourself. So you have the writers not only said, uh, look, we saw this or we heard that, but they turn the responsibility, the tables around and right in front of the critics, right in front of their critics, they said, you also know these things because you yourself saw, you yourselves know. Okay, can somebody read for us from Acts 26 verses 24 to 28? At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul. He shouted, your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. 
What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of these has escaped his notice because it was done in a corner. It was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time, you can persuade me to be a Christian? Thank you. Okay, so this part extracted from uh, Paul, Paul's defense for his own belief and behavior in front of Festus and King Agrippa, together with King Agrippa's wife. So this passage tells us Festus was present, King Agrippa was present, and Paul was defending himself when Festus interrupted him and said, you have gone crazy with your great learning. Yeah, so people have become insane. But Paul says, no, no, I'm not crazy. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. All right, so you see, the thing about the believer, the following of Christ is, it doesn't seem to gel with what the world says because everything is also similar but different. Yeah, but even though they are similar but different, the truth of Christ is even more outstanding and even more different and deeper. So true, but it's still reasonable because there is a certain, there is a certain intelligence to what God's truth is about. Okay, so Paul now appeals to King Agrippa and said, the king is familiar. I'm convinced none of this has escaped his notice. The king also knows all these things. So he six, speaks directly to King Agrippa. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And this is where we talk about speaking to people, uh, whether they are seeking honesty, truth. Just now remember intellectual arrogance or intellectual integrity, right? So here Agrippa is not exactly arrogant, but he doesn't want to believe. He's not prepared to believe. Do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? All right, so there are people who, in spite of the truth, they are not prepared to be a believer and a follower of Christ. But doesn't mean they don't know the truth. They still know enough of the truth to be convinced. Okay, so Paul appeals to the unbelieving, but the people who don't, they do not believe, they know, they know the truth. So what we see is it is a faith that's true, but it's not blind because it's based on history, facts of things that happened in history. And also we have firsthand eyewitness accounts and we have these people appealing to the firsthand knowledge of the people who listen, of people who read, and in fact, even critics, those who are not kind or friendly to the Bible writers of the truth. So we see that Christian faith is not a philosophical faith, not something you just discuss of the mind, appealing to philosophies of men, not something that come, men just come up with in thinking. And it's not a faith based on myths and legends, not cleverly invented stories, but truth that happened. So this is the thing, an objective faith, not something subjective and uh, that you can kind of like waver back and forth what you think and so on. But this is faith in a specific object, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Either you believe or you don't believe. There's no such thing as a, he doesn't exist. So you're just imagining, all right? It's objective faith means that is the truth of this person called Jesus of Nazareth. How do you respond to him? So faith in who he is, the Christ, Savior, Son of God, faith in what he did, 
rose from the dead for our sins to give us salvation for eternal destiny. Right, so objective faith, something that is real, something that is true, and then it's up to you to make your decision. So it does make a difference what we believe. There are, there are this uh, saying on an old cliche, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. This doesn't really make sense. It's not consistent with the Christian faith. Doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. Right? What happens if you believe something wrong? You might be sincere, but you are sincerely wrong. So is it okay to believe and be sincerely wrong in your belief? Example, there's a, there's a bottle of poison. All right? You know it's poison and somebody tells you it's poison and you say, okay, never mind. I just believe that it is, it's not going to kill me when I drink it. Yeah, I believe that it's not going to kill me when I drink it. Does it mean when you drink it, you're not going to die? You still will die, right? Karana? So you cannot say it doesn't matter what I believe. What you believe is important because if it is, what you believe is not true and what you believe can harm you, it will still harm you even though you believe the opposite. Okay, so when we believe, we have to believe something that is true, something that is objective and not matter of discussion, up to you, up to you, no, no right, no wrong, people say. Yeah, no right, no wrong, you just believe. It doesn't make sense where God is concerned. And Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 24, has something very serious to say about that. I told you, that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. So this is very strong. And it certainly says what you believe will kill you, can kill you rather. Or what you do not believe can kill you if you are wrong. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. So you don't believe the truth, it can kill you. That's, that's the meaning. You don't believe in the truth, it can end up in your death one day. Maybe not now, but certainly one day, you will end up dead. Okay, so Jesus is very point blank in this verse. You don't believe the truth about me, you will die one day. Okay, let's look at Romans 10, verse 9. Somebody read for us, and then another person, John 14, 6. Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, there you go, okay. Uh, John 14, 6. John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thank you. Okay, so these two verses tell us how to respond. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, and only he is the way to the Father. All right, so there you are. Objective faith in Christ, he tells us he is the way, and there's no other way. Okay, and last one for today is based on principles of truth. Truth is always open to honest examination. Yeah, so is the Christian faith. Honest examination is possible. G Peter appealed to the crowd to examine what they themselves knew, right? Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to, by God to you. God did among you all the miracles as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. So God already knew in advance 
and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So Peter was very, very direct, saying, you have involvement in the death of Jesus of Nazareth. You were involved. You yourselves know. Okay, so based on principles of truth, we can open, uh, we can be open to honest examination, may not be pleasant. Okay, so here's the thing, it may not be pleasant, but well, we need to know the truth so that even though it's not pleasant, we can make progress. Okay, so we will end here and next week we'll talk about response. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, that the truth of Christianity can be examined and can be believed on if it is really true. And we ask, God, that you will lead us with open minds and hearts, uh, not with our own preconceived ideas, but allow your Bible and the truths that are true about your Bible to give us conviction and certainty so that our faith is based on nothing less than absolute truth. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.